Okay. Uh, okay. So Gopala, um, uh, we have I have Gopala Krishnan on the other line, and uh, Gopala. Uh, before we get into the real serious things, how about we go through a little bit about your background and what you've been doing before you've, uh, you're doing what you're doing right now. Okay, sure. Uh, thanks, Gidido. Well, a little bit about me. My name is Kobala Krishnan, and uh, I'm from Malaysia, of course, a small town in Johor called Kluang. So, um, sometime around 2005, just around November 2005, I actually quit my corporate job because uh, I just felt that it was pretty much meaningless and just working like a you know, cubicle droid. So, once I quit my job, then my first option was to do something, I mean, sorry, my only option at that time, because I had no money and no other idea what to do, was to try to do something online. And that has evolved a lot in the past few years. I started with um, creating content sites, trying to make some money out of Google AdSense, and that worked well for a while. And then I moved on to, uh, I also added affiliate marketing, so I learned a lot about affiliate marketing at that time. Mm-hmm. And then I moved on to selling my own ebooks or information products, uh, as well as a lot of blogging, a lot of blogging. Um, then for the past few years, since 2010, we've been transitioning our company to this software provider, software development companies, and that's where we are right now. Ah, okay. Do you mind if I ask you a little bit more detail about that? Um, when you said previously you were working, which company was that? Uh, I was working in a telecommunications company, Telecom Malaysia, as an account executive. Ah, all right. I was selling underwater sea cables and I have never really, they have never actually seen. Underwater what again? Sea cables, you know, like you were sea cables saying, that power your internet and your phone calls. Right. Yes. And the sea, sea, and the sea yes. cables. And the sea cables. Wow. Okay. <laughs> you were doing that. Okay. And uh, yes. if you don't mind me asking, also, uh, where did you go to school? Uh, school. Well, uh, graduated from multimedia university with a degree right. in uh, M- multimedia M- marketing. Okay. And uh, before that, I was from. Um, Okay. Uh, and, and then in about 2010, you got into software. So, yes. um, specifically, what was that? What, what, what was uh, what's the name of your software? What did you do? Okay. Well, prior to 2010, I did dabble with in software development. Uh huh. And uh, just for hiring freelancers and going to Elance or Rent a Coder, which is now freelancer.com. Uh-huh. Um, I went to those portal sites and tried to get someone to develop some simple uh, computer software for me. I mean, uh, the software that you download and install to your Windows computer. Uh-huh. And also some simple scripts and some uh, WordPress plugins, etc. But in 2010, um, I grew a bit more ambitious and I wanted to create an actual fully functional uh, software or system that is targeted towards small business owners, entrepreneurs, and internet marketers. So at that time, I created a a software called BlockCell. It Uh doesn't exist anymore. Okay. (laughs) Now, I only sold it to about 10 people. So (laughs) that was one of the first software we created. That was the biggest learning curve I had was when I created this software. I learned what to I learn what to do and most importantly what not to do. Okay. Um so what does Block Cell do? Block Cell is like an all in one software that mm-hmm. does uh blocking, mm-hmm. content management, membership site, mm-hmm. and uh almost anything you need, uh if you're an internet marketer, uh trying to make some money online with your own membership site. So Block Cell does all those things. The logic at that time was that if someone wanted to do this thing manually, they'd have to get web hosting, get a domain name, and then install WordPress, mm-hmm. and then find some hacks or some plugins and put those plugins onto WordPress to turn WordPress into a membership site. Mm-hmm. And then they can start putting in the content. So this was like a shortcut. You just come to our software, select a username, select your uh, Payment uh, preferences. You click get started and boom, you're done. 
with the email marketing system, content management, uh, blogging system, with a way to actually manage multiple authors, meaning your website can have multiple authors writing content for you and you can track who wrote what content, how much you should pay them at the end of the month, etc. So it's basically like an all-in-one system for anybody who wants to create a, a membership site or a content site in a paywall or a paid uh, wow, section. I think I think that's really brilliant. I mean, like uh, otherwise, without Blogcell, if they were to do something like that, in short terms, it's going to be very hard and very technical, technical and very time consuming, right? Yes. So with Blogcell, it's um, uh, people can uh, get it all with just one solution. Yes. Mm, all right. So what what happened to this? You said it's not selling anymore. It's not available anymore. Yes. So what really happened? Uh, people seem to like it. But mm-hmm. nobody wanted to buy it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what you found out. Um, yes. uh, so uh, what happened to it? Did you just uh, uh, took it down or, or was did somebody buy it uh, over? Well, that, you know, perhaps you'll cover that later in our section about the things I learned about creating software. Oh, right. Um, everyone wants to, you know, sometimes when you don't do your research properly, your impulse is to go out and create a massive software. A software that by itself is an end to all other software, meaning you all just right. need to use one software and you can do anything you want to do as an internet marketer without having to subscribe or purchase multiple software. That's right. probably you know the first impulse that you'd get if you want to create software. A one-stop you want, solution you kind of thing. Yeah, a one-stop solution kind of thing. What I realized is that one-stop solution software is actually a very hard sell. Uh, mm-hmm. Primarily because you can only sell that to someone who doesn't have any of the components that is in your software. If someone already has a blog, let's say for for example WordPress, and they are already comfortable with using WordPress, so then whatever features you have similar to WordPress in your all-in-one software is pretty much redundant to them. And Mm -hmm. if they have an email marketing software like Aweber, and they're comfortable using that software. So although your software does all-in-one, but perhaps they only want one part of your software. And because it's packaged in such a way that if they want to use that one part, they have to use all the parts, so they are more reluctant to sign up. Mm, Okay, I get it now. How about what happened after BlockSell? So what happened after BlockSell is that I learned my lesson. I shut down BlockSell by informing my nine customers (laughs) that they're no longer going to... uh, continue with this idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing, of course, trying to create an all-in-one solution from scratch is that it takes a very, very, very long time um, to do. So you're going to spend a lot of money in development and it's a really hit or miss kind of situation. So anyway, I emailed these nine people and nobody responded, so I said, yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) So I cancelled all your nine subscriptions Mm -hmm. and then we were done with that. So what I did was I split this all-in-one solution mm-hmm. into five different solutions and one of the solution is to track advertising or marketing or uh, affiliate links I converted that into linktracker.com uh-huh. so now instead of an all-in-one software I have uh, five individual software and each of these five software does only one thing and does it very very well Okay, so I know about linktracker.com. That's one of your um, uh, best-selling products, I suppose. Yes. But you mentioned you have five. What are the other four? Uh, the other four I can't really mention yet. <laughs> All right. We, we never really went past internal testing with the software because uh, mm-hmm. when Link Tracker started to become more popular and we devoted more time into creating Link Tracker, and um, as the customers come in and then they have their own demands or they have their own feedback. So based on that, they got to improve it, they got to develop it. And there's a lot of other stuff that I didn't foresee with trying to create a web-based uh, software like hosting, server stability, hacking issues, etc. So that just went on. And uh, by the time I know, uh, well, Link Tracker has been on the market for more than two years now. Mm-hmm. And... Um, it's generating pretty good revenue for us. So the other software, well, it's either still unsplit from the main <laughs> block cell software or oh, already right. split up into a separate application by itself. Uh-huh. But I'm pretty much the only one using it and nobody knows about it. So maybe in the next uh, 
this year or so, we'll look at how we can uh, uh, revamp those and uh, try to push it to market again. And further develop it and release it, I yes. suppose. Uh, okay, because I had this idea that maybe you, you you've done a testing and see and found out that Link Truck is the one selling really well and focus on that. So I just want to clarify on that. Yes, pretty much. Oh, you did that? Uh, yes. I mean, we we developed Link Tracker because that was the easiest to develop. Uh huh. And then we put it out into the market. I just sent it to my list of subscribers, and I wasn't expecting anything. I was ready to move on to the next software. But then it started to move, and um, even from our first month, um, you know, the first year, the sales just keep on growing every single month. So I felt like, hey, we have something good here. Why don't we focus on this instead of trying to create more software that, you know, the future of those which and are I guess, uncertain. I suppose uh, uh, it is, uh, you do see that Link Tracker requires a lot more attention than, than uh, you expect that you have to develop it a lot more, so you focus a lot more effort on that, I suppose. Yes, yes and no. I mean, the software itself is pretty, it's pretty simple. I mean, uh, we developed the first version of the software based uh-huh. on what we think people wanted. Uh-huh. And uh, then we got feedback and we developed the second version of the software, which is much more user-friendly and has much, much more powerful features like campaign tracking. You can create multiple campaigns to track different sources of uh, uh, traffic or advertising and conversion tracking to see how much sales you've made, etc. And um, and uh, cloaking, link cloaking, a lot of other features. Uh, but the main thing why it took a long time for us is because we started off knowing nothing about software development. And although we had this software, uh-huh. like Link Tracker, uh-huh. It would have been much easier to just package it as a software that you can download and uh-huh. install on your own computer or, or on your own server uh-huh. and run it that way. But since we decided to make it a web-based application whereby uh-huh. everybody is going to linktracker.com to use their, their account, uh-huh. then there's a lot more, there's tons of things that we never anticipated that we had to know and eventually we have to spend time to learn uh, those things. Mm. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, if uh, maybe you can share with us uh, as much as you can about this, uh, we're gonna go into the development approach and your development methods and stuff like that. Um, uh, you can go as technical as you want, or maybe you'd like to reserve some information to yourself because you don't feel safe uh, telling others about it. Uh, that is really up to you. But uh, let's start with uh, your platforms, development platforms. If you don't mind sharing what you use for your servers, your, for uh, uh, um, uh, programming language and stuff like that. Your stack, in a way. Right. We use PHP mm-hmm. and uh, we uh, use the MVC uh, approach. Uh-huh. Uh, MVC, again, stands for uh, Model View Controller mm-hmm. Approach. Uh, and one of the most popular frameworks that we use is uh, Code Igniter. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. Yes, so we use Code Igniter uh, simply because it, it, is, um, it is a more systematic way to create software. And it has a lot of uh, logic, structure, standardization in it, whereby it's easier to build an application using an existing framework. Uh, oh. If you don't use an existing framework, then you will have five developers, each with their own preference or method of doing it, and those five developers cannot find a common ground as oh, to yeah. how the, the software itself should uh, function or the structure of it. It's hard for them to find a common right. ground. Well, right. if you ask them to use an established structure like uh, Code Igniter, uh, Code Igniter is like Ruby on Rails, right? right. It's like a, like a framework, but for PHP. Right. So number one is uh, Code Igniter itself has a lot of existing libraries and, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, frameworks and resources that uh, the programmers can use right away so they don't have to develop every single thing from scratch. You just have to focus on your application only. I think... Uh, yeah, yeah if, but, if I may um, cut you a little bit there. In a way, you're saying that if we don't have... Uh, if you're not using kind of like an open standard where um, 
known to a lot of people. We're going to have five programmers and all five programmers have their own thinking yes. of their own ways and it's really hard to manage yes. that. Right. Yes. So you're going with a code nighter with that. Now, how about um, do you apply any like uh, development methods? I mean, like uh, all this agile development is really the in thing right now, Scrum and Kanban. Do you know? Do you use any of that? I have no idea. <laughs> I just think all right. No problem. And how about um, project development tools and uh, 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 yeah, time tracking and stuff like that? Yeah, project uh, development tools. And this is, you know, something that we should have used much, much earlier. Uh, we use GitHub. Jacob. GitHub. How do you spell that? G uh, G I T H U B. Oh, GitHub. Uh, GitHub. Yes. GitHub right. or GitHub. Yeah. <laughs> GitHub. So we use GitHub, and that has really proven to be, you know, very, very effective at us moving faster because. Uh, when you have just one developer, it's okay if you don't right. use GitHub. But when you have more than one, and then you'll find many, many times, many situations where progress actually goes much slower because they keep, it, they keep, you know, erasing each other's work, overwriting right. each other's uh, work, uh, all working on the same thing at the same time. A lot of redundant stuff going on, and. Um, if they make a mistake, then they have spent more time to you know, fix correct, it. fix the mistake. Whereas with GitHub, you can just revert back to a right. version of your uh, of your code. Mm. So if you if you screw up, you know you don't have to um, uh, code everything from scratch. You just revert back to an older version, and right. you no longer have to manually keep a backup file of uh, of your software. We used mm. to do that. We used to backup of code every one week or so, you know. But we get how we don't have to do all those things. It's done, the, uh, the version control is there. It's done automatically. And uh, most importantly, it's very useful to manage coding, chat coding with uh, more than one developer. Uh, we've been talking about uh, having uh, working with uh, multiple programmers in the team. How many do you have right now? At the moment, we only have two full-time programmers. Two full-time programmers. Yeah. Okay. Now, talking about all these programmers and developers, do you mind sharing with me how um, do you do recruitment? How do you find them? How, uh, what offer do they get and stuff like that? Yeah, well, I'm not really that good at that. I mean, uh, I've found more bad developers. Than <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, then share with us your screening to process. Uh, okay, well, you know, the, the thing with developers is that I am not a developer. Uh, right. I'm not a programmer. So You're not a programmer by trade. Yes, but I'm if not. I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you do still do your own HTML uh, development. You do the web design and stuff like that, the UI and stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I I've never formally trained in that, uh -huh. but it's just something I did out of necessity because I wanted to build websites and I had no money to hire people, so I had to learn this stuff. Uh, but I'm just you know moderate or slightly above average uh -huh. HTML5 or CSS. Uh, that's about it. But I, I don't really know any actual programming language other than that. Okay. Um, so back to how do you screen developers? So what do you do? Right. To, to screen uh, developers in the early stages, I, I, I depended a lot on their resume. And as I found out a hard way, almost everybody lies in their resume. It's just a matter of how much do they lie. In that their is a really, really hard truth. Yeah, and it's very hard for a non-programmer to gauge the effectiveness or to gauge the true capabilities of a developer unless you look for certain things. So Unless you what? Unless you look out for certain things. Ah, uh -huh, all right. Um, so what I look out for nowadays is... Uh, passion, of course. Um, when 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 we look for a developer, I look at his overall involvement in his field, not just where he worked. Uh, I mean, I've hired some you know good so-called good developers who used to work with Asia or something like that, uh -huh. and uh, with really high expected salaries, glowing um, what do you call this uh, resumes, uh -huh. and yet. They just can't do the job. They just can't do it. Um, they don't perform very, as how yeah. you expect them to. Yeah. It's very common for you to look at uh, developers who used to work in large companies and you know, and then you always say, oh, we are part of the, this team who developed 
so so portal it now has uh, 200 million members etc but a real question you got to ask is it uh, correlation or causation right did they cause the project to be successful or were they just part of a, a project that is already successful uh, you know what I mean? yeah but maybe they were, they were just doing data entry within that <laughs> yeah yeah i mean <laughs> maybe they were just uh, <laughs> You know the most, the lowest level developer <laughs> there, who just uh, brings in coffee for the rest of the developers. I don't know. Yeah. So you, you you wouldn't really know that. I mean, uh, so that's that's the difficult part because you wouldn't really know if this person can do the job until they do the job. So nowadays I look for overall involvement. Like, um, is this person involved uh, actively contributing to any open source project? Uh, I look for is this person does he, does he have a, a GitHub account? Mm-hmm. If he does have a GitHub account, then it's very easy for you to check out his profile and see right. what, what open source projects he's contributing to, or you know his involvement level in uh, GitHub and so on. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Those are the things that I try to look into as well when I'm when I'm hiring, and uh, uh, I don't know if, whether you do this or not, but. Uh, I try to give at least a simple seven question questionnaire quiz to see um, the understanding on on uh, how well they are with programming. Oh yeah, uh, we actually do a, a on-site test now. Mm-hmm. So oh. if if we do a, a, a what do you call this um, uh, an interview for uh-huh. developers, mm-hmm. we have pre-developed a programming test. Mm-hmm. We ask them to use our computer, which is uh-huh. not connected to the internet. This uh-huh. is very, very important because if it's connected to the right. internet, they can always Google and just copy code from here and there and paste it into whatever you're asking them to do. Uh-huh. So it's very, very simple application. Let me give you an example of what one of our tests is. And this is for junior programmers uh, around uh, one to three years experience. Okay. We have created a login form for them, uh-huh. and we have created a, mem- a page where they go once they have uh, filled in the information on the login form. Uh-huh. We even created a username and password for them, uh-huh. and tell them, this is the login form, this is the username and password. You have to make sure that if someone enters this username and password, they are able to go to the page, uh-huh. and otherwise, produce an error message. That's it. For me, this is a very, very fundamental uh, development thing, which they probably studied in your, in your first year of uh, programming. Okay. And, mm-hmm. I, and that one session, we interviewed more than 20 people. None of them could do it. Wait, what, what is it supposed to do again? There's a login page, and, yes. and the candidate is supposed to enter their name and uh, 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 username and password. That we provide. Uh-huh. Um, okay. And uh, it's supposed to bring them to a specific page. Yes. So all it's supposed to do is mm-hmm. put in the verification process. Okay. So um, the login page is there, but the validation yes. is not there yet. Is that right? Yes. Yes. So uh, you're trying to test who can um, uh, write the program to process that and redirect user to the right location. Which is already provided. Which was oh the page is already provided. Yes, it's just the middle part. So you have the done login page. Everything. The login form. The login form the, is there. The end the the location is there. Button, mm-hmm. And the page, the, the page that you go to once they have logged in. But the middle part is not there. The processing. Yes. The username and password. Yes. Is it's not even a database. The password username is in a text file, and they just have to refer back to that text file. Uh, when, it, when uh, they put in username and password, you just have to check with the text file, is the username correct, is the password correct. If it is, go to the page. If it is not, display a message. Wow, that's, it. that's tough. <laughs> I mean, that's easy, but that's tough. <laughs> you know, huh. That you would go through uh, such like to, or to um, that's it. interview. But I think that is a very good idea to interview. And, and you know what? Uh, out of the 20 odd people that came here... Um, none? You said none just now? 20 odd people, 20 plus people uh-huh. that came here uh-huh. uh, to to do the interview. None of them could could do it. None, none, wow. zero, zero. None of them could do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, one person took three hours and finally told us that we couldn't do it. Uh-huh. Um, and actually, because of that, now we have a time limit. You must do it in 30 minutes. Wow. Okay. Uh, so 
Uh, and, and here's the thing. Mm-hmm. Some of the developers in their resume mm-hmm. have so-called stated that they have developed, you know, HR system, wow. uh, uh, time tracking system, uh, uh, invoice management system by themselves. Nobody else was involved. They were the only person who did this project for their previous company. So tell me, if, if someone can do a time tracking system all by themselves, can't they do a simple login form verification? That's my question. Yeah, I mean, login is supposed to be the first step in building yep. any web-based application. In anything. Right. So therefore, you know that most of the resumes are bullshit. <laughs> Sorry, my, don't mind yeah, no language. problem. <laughs> I'll edit that out, <laughs> or, or not. But anyway, I think that is a very good idea on how to um, interview um, PHP programmers, and I may um, try that as well myself when we do uh, our next recruitment um, uh, session. Uh, anyway, I'd like to get into um, your financials. Uh, the, what I know from um, uh, about Link Tracker and also your Joe Miyagi right now and how you started out. Um, a lot of um, software entrepreneurs they go through, um, they they go out and look for uh, seed funding, maybe through MSE Pre Seed or MDECTES or some venture capitals and whatnot. But you, I know for I, I from what I know, you've you've never um, gone through any of those and you started out with uh, just. Uh, with, with your own money, so is that right? Yeah. <laughs> so can you uh, uh, share a little bit about this? How how it started out, and how it snowballs over and over, and how it got bigger. Well, it's not like I never applied for grants. I did. Okay. Just never got that. <laughs> okay. Just never got approved. Well, I I, I never got approved. And and Too then bad for I, them, I, I suppose. No, I I realized that uh-huh. if you. Mm-hmm. Did it, have an idea uh-huh. and you think this idea is going to work, uh-huh. you have to figure out how can I make this idea work with my own money. So if your idea can only work if you get a grant of one million ringgit, uh-huh. then what if you don't get the grant? Then your idea will never ever you know, become real. So I, I try to develop ideas and think, of course, I, I, I want to apply for the grant for this idea. But what if I don't get any grant? Can I still continue with this idea? At least develop the first stage of this idea mm-hmm. with my own money. Mm-hmm. And that, that's what I try to do. Because if I'm going to just uh, depend on grants, and then what, what's going to happen is that instead of being able to create really good uh, ideas, really good software, I'm only going to create software that the person is giving the grant you probably understand. Let me give an example like uh-huh. Jumiaga. Jumiaga is an affiliate marketing platform, Jumiaga.com. Uh-huh. It's an affiliate marketing platform uh-huh. for Malaysia. Uh-huh. Uh, now, if you're familiar with affiliate marketing platforms like Commission Junction, Linkshare, uh-huh. Neverblue, uh, Clickbank, or whatso, uh, or, or you know, uh, something like that, right. you understand what Jumiaga is. Right. But when I apply for an MDEC grant, mm-hmm. The person evaluating this MDEC grant probably doesn't even know what is affiliate marketing. Right. So if you don't even understand the subject matter, how can they understand how my software is going to work? Uh-huh. And that's where I run into problems because when they give a feedback and they ask uh, follow-up questions, uh-huh. when I see those questions, I can understand they don't get it at all. Mm-hmm. They don't even know what is affiliate marketing mm-hmm. because they're making comparisons from, from Jumiaga to Muda.my. Muda.my uh-huh. is just a big, huge, classified website. That is it's something not, else. Yeah, that's something else. It's not an affiliate platform. So how can I answer a question when the question itself is wrong? Mm-hmm. So, and that's when I realized I'm not going to get this grant because the people in charge of getting this grant, they have very limited knowledge. Mm-hmm. And if you create a software that suits their knowledge, if you, create, if you want to create another Muda.my, for example, mm-hmm. or you know, if you want to create one of those so-called online booking systems, online bus ticket system mm-hmm. or whatever it is that the average person there can understand, mm-hmm. then you have a higher chance. But I don't want to do that. I don't want right. to do just another software that you know, everybody else is doing just for the sake of getting a run. So I just make sure that I am capable 
of financing my own projects. Uh, okay. And then I look for the grant. So if I get a grant, that's great. If I don't, it's not end of the world. Okay, how about this? Um, uh, when you started out Block Cell, how much did you sink into it? But I can tell you for a fact that from the time I, I started hiring developers uh-huh. until the time the first customer came in for Link Tracker, uh-huh. which is the software immediately after Block Cell, uh-huh. there was a period of about one and a half years. Okay. So in that one and a half years, we were just spending money on our developers and trying to get something done, but nothing was done. So there's a lot of money going there. Okay. Um, now, some some people who may not know you <laughs> may think that you must be like anak lot or something, or anak dato who have so, so much money to spend to build block cell for one plus years and not making any sales. But I know that you are not. So um, maybe you could explain a little bit um, where where did st- the startup capital came from. Well, it's all my own money. Mm-hmm. It's because before we started to go into uh, software development, mm-hmm. I was pretty much doing uh, uh, selling ebooks or information guides uh, mm-hmm. on ClickBank and so on. So uh, most of my money from there mm-hmm. uh, was channeled into software development. So I was making quite good money in one part of my business mm-hmm. and channeling all into the new part of my business, which is software development, and just. Gobala, you're still there. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Sorry. Uh, the the Unify is crazy. I'm on my Maxis mobile now. Okay. Oh. Uh, uh, let's. We were at financials. You right. you were saying that um, uh, your other business was doing really well, and that's where you find out the uh, revenue from there, or rather. Or the profits from there into um, software development. Yes. So I guess I get it now. Uh, I, I do get it. I'm just trying to uh, dig it out, out out of you so that other listeners or others who read this later would also understand. Um, uh, now uh, back into a little bit uh, into the financial part. So now you have Link Tracker and also Joe Miaga, both of those running um, right now, right? right. Uh, do you have any uh, anything else that's running at, at the moment? Uh, nope. Um, okay. Um, uh, we have we are working on something. Okay, but it's not something launched yet. It's not released. No. Okay, good to know. Uh, how about this? Um, are any of those um, self-sustaining or in or what I'm trying to know is whether the revenue can cover the operations? Uh, sure. I mean, uh, for for link tracker, it's a very straightforward, uh-huh. uh, uh, very straightforward deal. We create a product, and if you want the product, you can come to our website, pay us uh, according to whatever whatever you need. It's a monthly uh, monthly subscription, uh, so it's very straightforward. I mean, it was self sustaining after the first uh, two months, three months. You know, it was wow. very self. Yeah, it was uh, self-sustaining after the first, uh, yeah, let's just say three months. So after the first three months, you know, it was already uh, making a small profit. Uh, ah, so self-sustaining. You, I mean, from Link Track itself, you can cover rent and uh, employees and and marketing and everything. Oh, uh, no, 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 sorry, sorry. I mean, for, for the cost of the of uh, Link Tracker only, which means that, the software application, the servers that we use for Link Tracker, the marketing costs for Link Tracker. Because uh, in our company, we, we split up all our expenses by projects. Uh, uh, so, of course, there's an overhead project, uh, overhead cost. Like for the whole business? Office, office or employees. Uh-huh. So, uh, I didn't include my overhead cost into that uh, calculation. Which, How which about? The first three months, Link Tracker itself. Uh, assuming that if you stop working on it, nobody is working on it anymore, it was uh-huh. really self-sustaining because it could cover for the server costs and uh, any other costs directly related with that software. How about uh, can it cover um, uh, programmers? No, N- not yet at the moment. All right. No, I mean now it does. Oh, okay. Uh, but, but not at that three month three month point. Mm. Uh, yeah. okay. That would have taken another three more months. Or, uh, so, 
Okay. Uh, in the case of Jomniaga, Jomniaga is a different story altogether because Jomniaga is a platform. Before uh, we get into Jomniaga, I think we, maybe I just want to clarify this for the others later. Um, Link Tracker works like this, right? People um, where they select a package for Link Tracker and then they commit to it month after month after month. So they have to pay um, every month if they want to continue using the software. Yes. All right. Okay, now let's get back into Jomniaga. Okay, so Jomniaga is a completely different uh, story. It is a platform. It is not a product that we're selling. Uh, which means that it's like an eBay or it's like a Lelo, you know, it's a platform. eBay itself is not really selling new stuff. It's just a place that connects buyers and sellers. So the same with Jomia, guys. It's a place that uh, connects merchants, mm -hmm. someone with something to sell, and affiliates, the people who are going to promote those products and make sales. It, it's a marketplace. It's a marketplace, yeah. Right. It's a marketplace or a platform. Whatever, whatever you want to call it, right? Okay. So that is a different story altogether because they're not directly getting any income if nobody is using our software, right? Okay. They're, so the merchants, the merchants who sign up in Jomniaga are not paying us a monthly fee. Mm -hmm. They only, uh, they only get some small amount from them when they make sales. Ah, so okay. that was a much tougher deal to crack. But even that is, um, the revenue has steadily. Increasing uh, over the past few years. In fact, even Jomiaga itself, uh, Jomiaga's development took us like three or four times longer than the development time for Link Tracker because oh. it's much, much more complex software. Uh, anytime you want to develop a platform or a marketplace, mm -hmm. it is much, much more complex deal because you're looking at how do I manage the merchants, how do I manage the affiliates, how do I calculate which affiliate makes sales for which merchant? How do I calculate how much we are supposed to pay out to the affiliate? How do I calculate how much we are supposed to pay out to the merchant? Uh, how do we put in an automated process for the merchant to apply to sell his products in Jumiaga? And how, how do we provide more tools to the affiliates? Like in Jumiaga, mm -hmm. uh, we have developed a WordPress plugin that you can install in your WordPress blog and mm -hmm. automatically convert keywords all your blog posts to Jomniaga affiliate links. Oh. So it's like an automated way for you to promote products from Jomniaga. So all those additional things that help Jomniaga also, we have to develop one by one. I think generally for Jomniaga, from what I understand, there's the merchant and then there's the buyers. Right. Yes. Okay, uh, if you ask me... Jomniaga actually connects three different groups of people. The merchant... Ah. The person is selling something, the uh -huh. affiliate, the person is going to promote this to the buyer, and the buyer, the person who actually buys the stuff. Yeah, if you ask me, um, the more types of users that you have, the more groups of users you have, the more complex things are, yes. the more system is going to, the more complex yes. the system is so, going to be. So, of course, I did mention also that part of the development is to do a shopping cart system in Jumiaga, an order processing system. and. It's especially difficult because in Malaysia, mm -hmm. it's very hard to automate payments when people want to go to the ATM machine and mm -hmm. bank in money right. uh, to your account. And it's, it's not like just using PayPal where you can automate everything. Uh, when, when, when the automation is not there, then you have to do a lot of work to, to counter the loss of automation. Mm -hmm. And you can either do that by hiring more employees or creating a more automated system in the back end. So in Jomiaga, whatever you can see as an affiliate or a merchant, uh -huh. it's just 20% of the actual development work that went into the software because the other 80% is in the administration part, the back, right. end, back office part, calculation, the order processing, the refunding. And I'm glad to say that you know, um, because we have put in a lot of time in Jamaica and automate it to such a point that uh, we can even automate ATM deposits, you know, wow. not, fu not fully, mm -hmm. but, you know, 80% automation on ATM machine deposits, which is yeah. the most, I think most, in Malaysia, uh, it, and we're talking about the culture in Malaysia whereby a lot of people still prefer to go to the cash deposit, deposit yes. machines rather than paying online. Yes. So uh, you you've got that type of payment at least automated up to eighty percent. That is brilliant. Yes. Wow. 
Uh, okay. Um, so what's what's the fee like with Jobniaga? All right, Jobniaga. There's two types of vendor accounts that you can sign up if you um, if you want to sell your own products. The first is a standard vendor. Standard uh-huh. vendor are uh, for for uh, merchants who have nothing except for a website. They don't have a payment processor. They don't have a shopping cart. They have nothing other than just a website. Uh, so you can sign up for a uh, Junior Garden Standard Vendor mm-hmm. and we will give you the shopping cart system or the order processing mm-hmm. system. And uh, at the moment, you can just sign up for free. Uh, and once this is done, and then you can uh, put in the order links that we give you or the system that we give you and integrate it with your website. So instantly, you can accept credit cards, you can accept PayPal, everything through Junior Okay. The, the second... Uh, type of account is called a premium vendor account. This type of account is for merchants who already have their own shopping cart and already have their own payment system like mm-hmm. PayPal or IP88 or more pay, MOL pay. Mm-hmm. So for this type of merchant, since they have already set up everything, then we offer them a much simpler way to use Jumiaga, which is just through integration of their shopping cart to Jumiaga. So we don't give them with another shopping cart system or whatever. We want them to use their own shopping cart and just integrate with Jumiaga so that all our affiliates can start promoting their products. And okay. we have more than we have more than uh, thirteen thousand affiliates at the moment. Thirteen thousand. Yes. Well, that's a huge um, sales rep. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. How about this? Um, among those 13,000 affiliates, can you at least tell me the biggest check you've written for one affiliate? Okay, we, we pay all affiliates um, bi-weekly, which means every two weeks. Uh-huh. Right? So I think the biggest check was, uh, I think about, uh, it's not a check actually, <laughs> because most people want a bank transfer. All right. I think the biggest was uh, about, 9,000 ringgit for a two-week period. So, assuming that that's the same for the following two weeks, that will be 18,000 ringgit for one month. month. Wow, that's and, a lot. And this is just for the vendor. It's mm. it's not the actual sales. I mean, because yeah. let's say the vendor says 50% of the commission, mm-hmm. so out of one ringgit sale that we process, we put in 50 cents to his account and 50 cents to the affiliate account. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, if the vendor, if we pay the vendor nine thousand ringgit, let's say for example, mm-hmm. which means that there's another nine thousand ringgit that we have paid up to various different affiliates for promoting this vendor's product. Wait, <laughs> uh, and uh, okay, so here, here's your product that somebody can sell. So somebody wants to sell, and coming to Jomniaga, we can have um, other people who are also online promote this product and uh, they will also get rewarded for that it's like um, if I want to sell something I can get somebody else to help me sell it promote it for yes. me and they will get a cut from that from, from the sales that I make that's right so I get my cut the affiliates get my cut uh, yes. get, gets his cut or her cut and uh, the customer will get the product and you yes. what, what, what kind of cut do you get we take uh, we charge 6.5% uh-huh. Uh, plus one ringgit for each transaction uh-huh. uh, that is processed through Jumiaga. And this is the first type of vendor account. There's people who don't have a shopping cart, etc. And they use Jumiaga to accept orders and process sales. Uh-huh. Uh, then the charge is 6.5%, inclusive right. of any fees that we have to pay to PayPal or IP88 or something like that. Okay, and the other type where yes, um, I process payment myself and I just want Joe Niagara for its affiliate uh, affiliate uh, army of affiliates? Yes, that is a, that is a different model altogether. Uh-huh. Uh, we charge 30% of what is paid to the affiliate. So let's say ah. um, your product is 100 ringgit and you put in a, a 10% commission. So when a Joe Niagara affiliate makes sales for you, the affiliate uh-huh. gets... 10 ringgit and junior gas fees 3 ringgit. Uh, uh, wait, um, the product price, the product is priced at 100 and um, uh, the merchant set an uh, affiliate commission at 10%, so yes. that would be 10 ringgit. And affiliate, 
Jomniaga and our, our fees is thirty percent of what the affiliate earns. So uh, Jomniaga will get three ringgit. Yes. So by the end of the month, or maybe by the end of the two uh, weeks, you will invoice the merchant thirty no. ringgit. No, that will never work. Okay, so how does that work? The merchant has to uh, first when the merchant wants to start for uh-huh. premium India, uh, uh-huh. he has to put in an upfront, uh, uh, what do you call this, fund his account. Uh-huh. Let's say one thousand ringgit. So he put his one thousand ringgit to his Jumia account, and uh-huh. as each affiliate transaction is generated, it will be deducted from this balance. Uh-huh. And when the balance is low, then the merchant can log in and top up his account again. Mm-hmm. We will ne- we will never invoice the merchant oh, right. at the end of the month because there's a very high chance that nobody will pay. Right. So it's it's a prepay system. Prepay. Mm-hmm. So in the example just now, um, you will you will deduct thirteen ringgit from the fund. Yes. For a one hundred ringgit transaction. Mm-hmm. All mm-hmm. right. I get it now. Okay, I think more or less we understand uh, uh, about uh, Link Tracker and about um, Jomniaga. Now, how about we talk about a little bit on how you market this two products? I believe the most interesting thing is that these two are for a really, really different type of people. That's Every- right. I mean, uh, Link Tracker is more focused on advanced affiliate marketers or marketers, uh-huh. uh, primarily in the, in the US and also. For international scope, uh-huh. uh, whereas Jomiaga is super laser targeted to Malaysia only. Okay, let's start with Link Tracker. So, how do you do marketing for this? For that? Well, Link Tracker. The thing is, we have a policy at our company that we uh-huh. only develop software that we ourselves want to use. Okay. So um, that makes it easier because when you develop software only you yourself want to use, you already have one customer. Which is yourself. All right. <laughs> Which is yourself, right? Uh-huh. So, and when you start using uh, the software, uh-huh. right, and then you can really see, you know, what you need to improve on it, and you probably also know other people who also probably face the same problems as you are facing, and, uh-huh. and these are, are the starting point for you to talk about for your new software. So, in the case of like Link Tracker, uh-huh. um, what I did was I, I did a lot of Google. Adverse advertising, you know, uh-huh. uh, but mostly most of the sales came from one internet marketer um, who saw another internet marketer using Link Tracker, and they signed up. Then. Uh, okay, who, I mean? who are they? Who are they? Yeah. You mean uh, who are the internet marketers? Yes. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, well. Uh, oh, you don't know. Well, I have uh, Michael Fortin, one of the really popular copywriters, yes, who signed up for, for Link Tracker uh-huh. because he was working on a project with another popular internet marketer called Armand Morin. Um, and he saw Armand Morin using Link Tracker. Uh-huh. So he was like, What is this? What, what is the software that you're using? And so he came and signed up uh, immediately and he's been using Link Tracker ever since for the past uh, two years or something like that. And uh, the other thing I did was because I realized that um, what I want in the early stages is to expose Link Tracker to as many people as possible. Right. I don't really have to charge people uh, for Link Tracker if I feel that they can benefit Link Tracker in a big way. Uh-huh. So what I did is I give a lot, give a lot of free accounts to a lot of internet marketers. And tell them, hey, we have this software. It's good for you. you know, it's good for intermarketers. It does this. It does this. Here's your free account. If you want to use it, you can use it. It's always going to be free for you. So when they start using it, uh-huh. uh, then the people who they deal with on a daily basis notice that they are using this software, and they want to check us out. So although I give a you know, couple of free accounts to a few internet marketers, and only maybe. 30, 40% of those people actually use it. Mm. But just by those 30, 40% people using the software, it builds a lot of exposure. Because Link Tracker itself, there's another magic formula which I can't really reveal, but wow. it's, it, it's created in such a way that the more people who use the software, uh-huh. the more people who would know about the software. I mean, it's like a viral marketing effect. 
And the same with Joe Miyaga. Uh, I have, uh, we have figured out, we have figured out very early in our software development process. Uh-huh. And it's one of the points that we have in our company policy that the software must market itself. Mm. The software must market itself. We must find a way to make sure that if 10 people use the software, then while just by the act of them using your software, another 100 people would know about your software. You get what I mean? Yes, I do. But yes. um, you're not going to tell us exactly how. Well, it's, it's different for each software. Um, but that is the underlying I concept. I give an example of okay. like Jumia Girl. Uh-huh. Right? In Jumia Girl, you just have a single account uh-huh. for buyer, vendor, and affiliate. It's all buyer, the vendor, same and account. All right. So let's say you sign up as a Jumia Girl vendor today, mm-hmm. and um, the affiliates promote your products, uh-huh. and you get some customers. So these customers buy through Jomega, right? Uh-huh. And they are only well, buyers. Their status is just buyer. But it's all the same account. So if they log into the account later to check their previous purchases, they will see another link that says affiliate. If they click on the link affiliate, then they'll say, hey, I can also become an affiliate of Jomega. Mm. So now they become an affiliate and they start to promote the products. Mm-hmm. And they bring in new customers who will also, basically, we're trying to convert as many buyers into affiliates and convert as many affiliates into um, Merchant. the merchants themselves. Right. So, that's the only way we can sustain without having to spend a lot of money on advertising. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah, it will, would, um, getting your word out there, your, your name out there, has always been about how much money you can spend on advertising. So right. if you can do it without having to spend much on advertising, that is really, really brilliant. Right. In fact, before we decide to, because we have written it down as a key mm-hmm. pillar of any software that we develop, mm-hmm. while we are developing the software, mm-hmm. we actually make changes to the software mm-hmm. if it does not market itself. If it cannot market itself, then instead of doing it this way, we will do it another way at the end of the day, the end result is the same, but by doing it in a different way, the software becomes uh, self-marketing. Mm. Okay. Okay. Now, how about other types of marketing? Do you do SEO? Do you do AdWords or PR campaign, email marketing, those stuff? Uh, we do SEO. Mm-hmm. And I have learned SEO for you know, just God knows how many amount of years that I tried to study SEO. Yeah, the thing I, is, SEO <laughs> keeps changing. Yeah, it keeps changing, but the basics are still the same. The basics is that if your product is good, mm-hmm. then it must be in Google because mm-hmm. Google wants to show customers what is good. Uh-huh. So that's all I, I, I do SEO by just that method. So if Jomianga is the only or the best affiliate marketing system in Malaysia, then when somebody in Malaysia types in affiliate marketing, they must see Jomianga in the first page. If they don't, that means Google is not working. So I don't focus too much on the, the, tip, the, you know, the nitty-gritty stuff of SEO, you know, and I don't read SEO stuff at all, actually. I just know that if you create something good enough, then you will get ranking for, um, uh, you will get a good ranking on Google. Right. But at least the rest have... of it is just basic knowledge on how to format your HTML tag and stuff like that. So, okay. So. Just to get this, this get this out of the way, do you do any offline marketing talks, trade shows, corporate meetings, radios, and stuff like that? Yes, I do offline marketing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do talks, and there are not many of those uh, talks available in Malaysia because internet marketing is very small, it's a niche market in Malaysia. So whenever I do get invited to talk, I will talk and I will make it uh, related in some way to Jomia, like why okay. I'm doing this talk, <laughs> okay. why I'm doing this interview. Any, and anything um, offline when I talk, I try to find something that I can relate to back to Jomia or, uh, or, or Link Tracker. And I do mention that, so it's not direct marketing, not direct selling something offline, but more like just branding. Okay. Uh, how about um, you can share any tools that you use for marketing, analytics or case metrics or email marketing software? Uh, okay. 
Um, the ones I mentioned before are GitHub. GitHub, that yeah, is for that's, development. It's just very, very important. Uh-huh. I use Basecamp. Uh, Basecamp, okay. Yes. Basecamp is more like a communication platform, management right. platform. You can set the to-do list, who's supposed to do what, right. and you can share files, you can keep track of you know, everything you've done so far. Uh-huh. And uh, that's from the development part. So from the uh, marketing part, mm-hmm. um, I use Aweber, which is email marketing software. Aweber for email marketing? Yes. I use uh, Pingdom. 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 Pingdom is a software that checks the uptime of your website. Mm-hmm. This monitoring. is very, very important because when, if, if Joe Miaga is down for five minutes, right. you get tons of phone calls, you know, and, right. and, and you won't know. You don't want to be the last person to know right. when your website is down. Right. You want to be the first person to know when your website is down. Uh-huh. So the, the only fix, way you can... And fix yes. things before you get any calls. Before you get any calls. You want to be the first person to know that your website is down for 60 seconds. Right. Uh, so the only way you can do that is to get a website or uptime monitoring service mm-hmm. and use Pingdom. So mm-hmm. when the, our website service is down, I will get an SMS immediately mm-hmm. uh, and all my staff will also get an SMS. So the person who's responsible can quickly go and check and you know, try to get it, get the server up again as mm-hmm. soon as possible. I mean, this, with this tool alone, we have managed to get a 99.99% uptime mm-hmm. for the past three months, which wow. is very, very hard to do. Uh, but, you know, for any kind of web, host, web or hosted application or a software as a service, uptime is one of the most, most important things uh, for your software. How uh, about analytics? Um, well, I use Google Analytics, mm-hmm. but, you know, I don't really pay much attention to it. Okay. I, I do look at it once in a while, but not all the time. Right. Uh, it's not something that you do and open up and see it every day. No. It's more important to see how much money is, is coming in. Yes. Um, <laughs> there are so many other important things to develop software mm. other than looking at how many visitors, visitors you have. Yeah. <laughs> okay, how about this? Why don't you, you share with us some of the achievements that, that um, Link Trucker and also Joe Miyaga have achieved? I, I know that you all you said that at least Joe Miyaga now has 13,000 affiliates. Maybe, yes. maybe you can share about the number of other types of users or um, yeah, anything that you can share with us about your achievements. Well, Joe Miyaka, I think in total since it started in um, May 2011, it has processed more than 500 ringgit, 500,000 ringgit in transaction. Wow, okay. Uh, so that's one thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Joe Miyaka is ranked number one in uh, if you type in affiliate for google.com.my, just affiliate, just the word affiliate, then you see Jumega on the first page, right? And if you... All right, I see it. Right yes. after Wikipedia. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah, but it's really it's up there. Yes. So affiliate marketing, you know, you type in affiliate marketing, it also comes up, you know, as the num- number two after Wikipedia. If you type affiliate program, a- any keyword that... That, that relates to affiliates. Yes. Okay. If you type affiliate program, affiliate programs, you see Jumega definitely somewhere there. All right. Somewhere there. So that's another thing that we've done. Uh, it's not by accident, of course. We got those search engine rankings because we know what we're doing mm-hmm. uh, by using the correct search engine optimization. Mm-hmm. And um, and other than that, for Jumega. Uh, well, I guess that's it. <laughs> yeah, okay. That, that, even those are uh, pretty amazing. Now, um, maybe you can share with us some challenges or a bit of failures that you've uh, accounted in the past. Well, um, some of the challenges that I mentioned before, but uh, really the most difficult part for us, which we struggled a lot with, is the uptime of your software. I mean, uh, it may seem like, you know, a lot of things when you want to develop software, you're so focused on the software itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when it's an application, then sometimes what's more important than the software itself is the server that is supporting the software. Because imagine if you are paying me 
uh, our company monthly mm -hmm. to run your software application to our hosted platform. Mm -hmm. And then when you want to use it the most, the server is down. Oh, yeah, that's and a bad thing. One hour or one hour, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it, it suddenly... Um, it suddenly occurs to the customer that, oh my god, I can't use the software. Right. You know, it's not like the software is on your computer, you can use it anytime you want. So this is a hosted application, and even if the server is down for one minute or five minutes, you know, there will be a lot of angry customers, there will be a lot of people leaving, there will be a lot of people talking in the forums that your software is no good, or that it's good, but okay, uh, so it's unreliable. Right, so talking about keeping up the uptime of the servers, do, do you mind sharing what you've done to um, make sure that your service is, is always up all the time? Uh, I mean, yeah, it can be because of uh, a lot of things. It can be um, our own programming errors. It could be uh, a sudden surge of traffic from some promotion somebody did somewhere, or it could even be um, uh, hackers or, uh, or anything. So do you mind sharing with us what you've done to make sure that um, um, everything is always up and running? We have uh, an independent company who monitors uh, our server, not Kingdom, Kingdom is just a tool to monitor our time, but it's an independent company that we uh, deal with that uh -huh. uh, on a weekly basis looks at, uh, at our server and also on a daily basis looks at our server to see are there any malware on our server, you know, uh, is there anything wrong with our server, is it uh, being underutilized, is it being overutilized, is there any other problem in the server? So you take a more preemptive method of looking at our server. So normally, you know, your server, if you have a server, you don't look at it until the server goes something down. Something is wrong, yeah. Until something is wrong, server is down for one hour, and then you start to look at your server. Then you start to panic. Off. But the problem is, if you wait for that to happen, then, then customers are going to be very so we have to do preemptive checking. We, um, the company that we work with actually looks at our server, uh, runs a scan on, uh -huh. on all files in our server to detect any possible threats to the server, uh, looks at possible loopholes or methods that hackers can use to hack your server, because our software has got hacked a few times. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, did it cause any... Um, uh uh, huge damage, or was no, it? No, the, was it able the, to the, the biggest damage was to the reputation, of course. Oh, all right. right. Because when when that happens, suddenly customers feel like their software is not secure. Um, I mean, anybody can get hacked. Twitter right. get Twitter got hacked. Uh -huh. New York Times got hacked. Facebook got hacked. Uh -huh. Anybody can get hacked, but you can't make it too easy for the hackers, right? Right. Just so, like, okay, you just said like I'm saying a theft happens everywhere. That doesn't mean that I'm going to just put my wallet on the table while I am browsing or playing games on my iPhone or something like that. You can't invite the thief right. into your home. You know? So that happens, hacking happens, but we can't make it so easy. So what this company does is it closes up all the loopholes, it hardens the server, it looks at um, possible ways of hack. I'm not saying that the server is now unhackable, it's just right. that unhackable for the lazy hackers. <laughs> the hackers that are just going to be used to common available tools to them. Um, it's much, much more secure. Do, do you mind sharing with us uh, what's the name of that company? Well, you can just go to Google and you can type outsource server management and you can find lots of companies. Uh, oh, okay. So it's it's kind of like a uh, a contract thing that you have with that company. It's not yes. an online service where um, they do automated scans every week or, or stuff like that. It's an online service. They it's an online scans. service? Um, it's not kind of like... a, a Consulting type of service? No, it's a it's an online service and they do automated scans every day, every every month, uh, and so on. But they also do other manual stuff as per need basis. Ah, so if, right. if we have something wrong with the server mm -hmm. and we don't know how to fix it, then we can ask this the people in this company to fix it for us. I think apart from um, 
you being preemptive with um, protecting your servers like this. What's interesting to see here is that you outsource this part of the of the business of of yeah of the task. Um, I mean, like some company would want to have this in house and stuff like that. So, uh, what's your view on that? Well, the thing with having it in house, now this is a problem. Most of our hacking attempts mm-hmm. happen, or most of the ha- hacking incidents uh-huh. happen 4 a.m. on Sunday. Uh-huh. So, 4 a.m. on Sunday, there's nobody in our company that is able to respond fast enough unless your company has staff looking at their server 24 hours a day, mm-hmm. which is very difficult for a small company like us. Uh-huh. Uh, it's very, very difficult for a small company like us. So the only way we can make sure that somebody is looking at our server all the time is if we have another person also looking at the server. I'm not saying that we don't manage our server at all. We do. But in the case where none of the staff is available, you know, it's a public holiday, a lot of hacking attempts happen on this kind of uh, period. Public holiday, New Year's Eve, whatever it is, because the hackers themselves know that on these days, most companies are vulnerable because mm-hmm. they have less employees working and they won't be able to respond very fast. So they can, they can inflict the most damage on these particular days. Sunday is a very, very popular day for hackers to, you know, uh, to do stuff like this. Mm-hmm. Because in, in a in a in a gown organization, for example, uh, nobody yeah. is working on right. Sunday, right? Nobody works on the Saturdays. Nobody sure. So, so if they hack the website on Saturday and Sunday, then by the time somebody does something on Monday, they have already achieved you know whatever they want to achieve for three days. Mm-hmm. So that's why it happens in the weekends. Those are all the vulnerable times. So we just want to cover those weaknesses now. Right. And we can't do it by in-house personnel unless we hire staff who can work on shift, work midnight, and work Sundays, and mm-hmm. work every single day. Mm-hmm. And it's just not possible for now. Right, I think uh, in in some cases, especially especially uh, software development companies, sometimes securities and hardening and network are not really their core skills. Yes, yes. that's the other thing. Uh, I mean, to do all those things, we need to hire a server technician mm-hmm. who you know who is is really pretty much redundant. Unless we have a web hosting company, mm-hmm. we don't need an in-house full-time server technician mm-hmm. who can work twenty four hours a day. Uh, so even if we hire a server technician, we need to hire at least two of them to make sure that right. they are covered 24 hours a day. Uh-huh. And it just it doesn't justify our business because we are not a web hosting company. We are not a web hosting provider. Uh-huh. We are a software provider and the server is just one part of the service. And it's a very important part, but we just don't have like that many servers yet uh-huh. to, to justify hiring two in-house. server admins in-house. All and right. we two server admins in house. If you have one of them on leave for uh-huh. three days, then you then then you still have a vulnerability there. Okay, I think um, I'm getting towards the end of my interview. Um, uh, if, I don't know if you know this, but I belong to this group called Jome Web. I have that face, uh, group on Facebook. It comprises of a lot of developers, web programmers, web designers, or s- uh, some server admins who does uh, really um, high availability stuff and load balancing. But um, a lot of us uh, want to start and build an online software business like you do. So what advice do you have for people like us? Hmm. My advice would be to build something that you can sell. I mean, of course, sure, everybody wants to be a billionaire like Mark Zuckerberg. Uh-huh. So, I, I wouldn't advise people to go out and try to build a Facebook. You know, uh-huh. Because that, you're talking about a billion dollar business that uh, will require tons of investors, millions of dollars of capital investment, all before you can even make one ringgit in revenue, if you right. go like the Facebook model, right, you need right. something for free and uh-huh. hoping that you can get, you know, a few million users and then you make money. I would recommend something, creating something that you can sell right away. So Some if you can create a software, a simple software, let me give you an example. Uh-huh. One of the easiest ways to get started in uh, 
software business is to huh? look at what are existing systems out there that are massly adopted, uh, massly used by people, and try to figure out how you can uh, find a niche market in that and develop something for them. For example, uh-huh. let's take WordPress uh-huh. or Joomla. So these are all established open source software that uh, many, many people use, including, right. say, OS Card or Open Card. Right. So there are many people using this software, uh-huh. but the open source software itself doesn't do everything that these people want to do. So you can always create something that latches on to these popular platforms and it'll be much easier for you to get customers away. I, I think we all know this one company also, right, in, um, in, in race in Asia called Joom Social, right? Uh-huh. So they, they, they uh, developed a social platform but for Joomla, right? Right, right. Uh, so that helps them to tap into the existing base of users who are really using Joomla. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're selling it as a product where right. somebody can buy it and use it. They're not trying to create their own social network site. They're just creating a social network type of plugin or module mm-hmm. for Joomla. So do you think this is something that people can start on the side while holding a, a full-time job? Yeah, sure. Why not? I mean, there's so many opportunities in uh, software, mm-hmm. uh, software development, and you should actually try to get something started uh, on the side because then there's less pressure on you to you know, make money from the software right away and you can spend more time trying to create a better product. I posed this last question to my last uh, interviewee, and that is, which is more important, software development, uh, developing the software, or marketing? So, in your uh, in your case, your answer? Uh, I may be biased, but I believe it's always better to create a good product and keep on improving your product. Because um, marketing, well, let's put it this way. If I create a substandard product, it's mm-hmm. going to take me much, much more effort to convince people to use my product. To market or to sell. Yes, right. to market or sell the product. Right? So if I create a crap product, let's put it this way. I like to speak in ex- extremes. So if I right, create no a problem. crap product and I want to go around and convince everybody that my product is good, this could going to take a lot of effort, a lot of money, a lot of money spent. Mm-hmm. That's if I can improve my product and actually make it better, then I need to spend less time on marketing. That's, that's how I, I think. I All still right. need to spend some time on marketing, but of course. it's so much easier to sell a good product than to sell a brand. Okay. Well, I guess um, I, I've asked, uh, most, I've covered most of the things that I want to ask you. Um, perhaps uh, before we end this, maybe you have something else that you want to share. Um, I just want to share that um, if you want to develop software and you want to uh, make money from software development, there are two options that you can go with. The first option is to create game-changing software, software that you know nobody has seen before mm-hmm. or does things that nobody even thought was possible. Mm-hmm. Now, the second option is to look at what software out there that people are already paying for and try to develop a better version or a different version of the software. Mm-hmm. The problem with the first method is trying to develop super software that nobody has seen before is that you don't really know if people are willing to pay for it. Mm-hmm. So you may come up with the best software that does the best whatever thing, but if nobody wants it, then you're in big trouble. Well, right. if you take the second method, look at what are people willing to pay for. So if you say people are willing to pay for uh, uh, CRM software, like mm-hmm. Salesforce, mm-hmm. right? So it's proven Salesforce. Yes, people are willing to pay for a product like Salesforce. Now, within the same idea, can you try to maybe get... Of course, you don't want to create another Salesforce. You don't want to create an exact version of Salesforce. Mm-hmm. You want to take this Salesforce idea and say, what is the problem with Salesforce? Maybe Salesforce is too expensive. It's not. It's, it's not too big. It's too big. It's too complicated for. Or maybe small too small. Businesses. It's too complicated for small right. businesses. It, it's maybe Salesforce is targeted to large companies. Mm-hmm. So, but you know that the market exists. So maybe you can create 
a simpler version of a CRM software that is catered to um, small business owners or in a different niche market. Maybe you can create a so-called CRM software for government or for anything like that, you know. But right, right. I think still, I understand. It's still in a market. It's a, it's a type of product that is proven to sell. Mm. So that's much less risky for you to try because the, the concept is the same. The business model is the same. You're just applying it to a different niche market. Okay. That is um, very insightful. Um, I guess that's it. I've uh, We've covered pretty much uh, today. And I thank you very much, Gobala, for sharing all this insightful information and your wisdom and your ideas on uh, building an online software business. Maybe we can talk again sometime, though. <laughs> <laughs>